It's time for Living Faith from the Russellville Christian Center. Join us as we study the uncompromised Word of God and how it can be applied to our everyday lives. Strong signal. That's tonight's message. Strong signal. If our words send a message, and they do, our words send a message. If they send a message, and if they send our lives in a direction, and they do, <laughs> we'll look at it tonight. No wonder people don't seem to be getting anywhere. Because they're sending mixed signals. And you know, if, if you start going in a direction, but you're not real sure, have y'all ever gone in circles? Whether it's in a store, on the road, in a relationship. Have you ever just gone in circles? And, and you, you think you know where you're going and then you, you, things change and you change your mind and it's just, it's confusion. Just know that anything that's confusion is not from God. He's the author of peace, not of confusion. So in words, we can't afford confusion. We can't, we can't mix them and expect to get anywhere. Our words set our lives in a direction. They set our will in a direction. They set our mind in a direction. They set our bodies in a direction. You know, we laugh about this all the time, but if we're going to do anything, we say it first. I mean, have you ever just laughed when somebody says, I'm going to the bathroom, like we need to know? <laughs> but we do it. Why? We're, it's to get us up. Or I'm going to go. I'm going to go do the dishes. Why do I need to say that? It's it's really so I will get up and go do the dishes. It sets our, it sets our will and it sets our our being into motion. Well, if words do that and we're mixing our words, when it comes to healing, prosperity, anything that we're taking, we're supposed to be taking God's word over our circumstances. And if we're going back and forth mixing our words between faith and doubt, then we are sending a mixed signal, and it's confusion. It's confusion to our minds. It's confusion to the circumstances. We need to send a strong signal, a plain message. It reminded me, Haley, of the message I sent you by text message. We need to make it plain. Devil, get out. Leave me alone. We need to make things very plain where they cannot be misunderstood a plain message. We can't be sent in our bodies, people, or circumstances mixed messages. Our marriages can't be a mixed message. I can't love him sometimes and not love him sometimes. I can't be for him sometimes and not be for him sometimes. I, I'm killing my marriage if I'm doing I'm bringing chaos into my relationship if I'm doing that. Friendships, work relationships, uh, finances. I can't talk about how God has supplied all my needs one moment and the next minute be afraid I'm going to lose my job and be running my mouth about it the whole time. I'm sending those circumstances a mixed message, a, a weak signal. They don't know what to do because I'm not making it very plain. And this whole universe is set up on a system of words. It was created by words. It is held by his words, the power of his words. Light is still being because he said light be. We've got to remember the importance of words. And we've heard this message. I can't even tell you how many times we've heard this message around here. And I still need it. Because naturally, by default, if the tongue is loosed, and we'll see that here in a minute, the course it takes is not the positive one. It takes the negative course. And so we have to train it. So let's go there, James chapter 3. You probably knew we would. James chapter 3, we're going to start reading in verse 1. I didn't have room to put it in your notes. And I encourage you, even if I do put the scriptures in your notes, please bring your Bibles or look at it on your device because it's important for you to look at what we're reading and see the word for yourself. Sometimes you'll get things that... Sometimes I'm, if I turn to it in my Bible... I see notes that I wrote 10 years ago. And I go, oh man, I forgot. Ken Stewart said that 10 years ago. Sometimes I write out who said it. Or Charles Capp said that 15 years ago. And it just reignites in me. And so always do that if you can. All right, verse 1. 
My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. That means teachers. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect or mature man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Let's just pause and think about that a minute. If we don't mess up in word, the same is a mature man and able also to bridle the whole body. I don't know about y'all, but my body needs to be bridled. It needs to be controlled. My flesh needs to be controlled. My attitude needs to be controlled. My words need to be controlled. My eating needs to be controlled. My exercise, my health needs to be controlled. I, he has given me the power to bridle the whole body. Verse 3, behold, we put bits in the horse's mouths. Why? To control it. Because it'll make, it will make the horse obey you. So what he's telling me, Ollie, and he's telling me if I put a bit, if I put the control of the word in my mouth, I can control my body. Bat, bits are not comfortable. Have you ever put a bit in a horse's mouth? Or watch somebody put a bit in a horse's mouth. They do all kinds of funny things, don't they? With their tongue, with their mouth. They're, it's like, this isn't natural. You're exactly right. It's put in there to overcome the natural. Just like we're doing tonight. We're putting the word in there to overcome what our mouth would naturally do, what our bodies would naturally do, what our affections would naturally do. We're getting control. Verse 4. Behold also the ships which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. We can pretty well understand this right now during hurricane season. If you have a big ship and it has outside circumstances overpowering it, it, the ship, can still be controlled no matter what the circumstances are by its own rudder that is controlled by the driver. He's fixing to tell us that rudder is the tongue and we are the captain of that ship. We may not can control the circumstances, the winds that are blowing, but we are in control of where it takes us. Even so, verse 5, even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindles. Though it's small, but it is so powerful. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defiles the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and is set on fire of hell. Now that sounds really bad. We're going to read a little further, but I do, want to get, I do want you to get the power of it. It can defile the whole body. He also just above told us it could control the whole body. It sets the course of nature. Let's just take it out of the negative for a minute and put it in the positive. The tongue can set the course of nature. Your whole eternity changed because of your tongue. It's set on the fire of hell. Every kind of beast, and of bird, of serpents, and everything in the sea is tamed and has been tamed of mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil and full of deadly poison. And the untamed tongue, that is the truth. And if you've ever sat around unbelievers very long, you've heard it. It is an untamed evil, and it is, it is poison. And that's, that's where it is without us putting that bit in and applying that rudder to change it. Verse 9 says, Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and wherewith curse we men, which are made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing, my brethren, these things ought not so to be. There is an alternative to the natural. These things ought not be that way. Blessing and cursing should not be coming out of the same mouth. Does a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Well, I don't know. Let's pause and think. If you go to the creek, now we don't have to worry too much about poison river. Well, maybe we need to be a little concerned, pray over our water. But back in the old days when the cowboys and the Indians would go down to the creek, 
And then they would get the belly ache because the river was poison. You remember those westerns? Well, that crew doesn't. I'll talk over here. Does this section remember? Okay. Y'all just need to go watch some old westerns. They, I'm telling you, you get a lot of ministry material out of them. The water may look good, but if there's poison in it, it's not good and poison. It's poison. Now, you put this in line with our words. If our words are good sometimes, but we add a little bit of bad in them, it's poisoned. It it goes, when we mix things, it goes to the weaker level. It loses its strength. Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either a vine figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. If you take water and you add poison, you have poison. It's just that simple. We cannot mix faith and doubt. The result is doubt. We can't talk one way when we're in the church or when you're talking to me or when you're talking to one of the members of the congregation. Talk faith and then when you go to work, talk doubt. That's mixing your water and your poison. And you're going to have doubt. That's, it, just, it weakens it. I don't care if we're quoting the word 80% of the time and talking doubt 20% of the time. That's great. We've got to take care of the 20%. We've got to get doubt out. If you had 80% pure water and 20% poison and I give it to Josiah, are you going to take of it? Why? Because there's still an effect from that 20%. It might not kill him right on the spot, but it puts death at work in his body. Doubt does the same thing. We, We cannot afford to mix our words. The words of Jesus were so undefiled. And if you, I went back and just read some red letter stuff today. You ever done that? Just, just go straight to the red letter stuff, which means Jesus was speaking, if you're re- reading the King James Version. I like red letter Bibles. I do. I, it just, it brings it to life to me that Jesus, even if it says Jesus said, if it's in red, it's like, wow. It really pops for me. So I went back and read some stuff. In John 12, verse 49, Jesus is speaking and he said, For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me. He gave me a commandment. What I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, So I speak. Jesus' words were so undefiled that he said he only speaks the things that his father has commanded him to speak. Oh, no wonder he got the results he got. You know when he said something, Karen, he meant it. He wanted it. And that's a big key for us. Don't speak what you don't want. Speak what you want. If you want life, you're talking life. If you want your marriage, you're talking love. If you want your job, you're talking commitment, diligence. You're not talking bad about your boss if you want your job. Let's let's just put this where we live. We can't mix our signal to the circumstance. It's got to be very plain what we want and our words speak our will. It's the way we're made. Jesus spoke things in strong signals. And this was really fun. I I didn't give you very many of them. I just gave you one. But y'all can study them. When Jesus would speak to things or about things, he, he did not mix his words, Patty. You didn't have to wonder what he wanted. It, he was not undecided. Mark 11 starting on verse 12. And on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came, if haply he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. 
And Jesus answered, you know, I love that. I have to stop there every time. The fig tree said something, and Jesus didn't like what it said, so he answered it. Your body's saying something, and if you don't like what it says, you better answer it. Don't let it keep talking. Answer it. If your finances are saying something, and you don't like what they're saying, are you answering it? Are you speaking back against it? Your marriage, if it's saying something and you don't like what it's saying, are, you, are we answering it? Jesus answered and said unto it. And this is just proof, y'all. I know people think we're crazy because we talk to things. You do it too. You do it too. You talk to things around your house all the time, just listen to yourself. But we talk about them just to talk about them that has no power. Jesus talked things to change things. He said to it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. Now there's just no misunderstanding that. There is no mixed signal in his wording at all. That tree knows exactly what it's supposed to do. And his disciples heard it. That's an important phrase. It's good to think right, but don't forget the power of words. He didn't just stand in front of the tree and think it. He said it. He made it plain, and the disciples heard it. He sent an undeniable signal. There's no question. This was a strong, undeniable signal. All right, verse 20. You know we've got to skip down. And in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, calling to remember it, said to him, Master, behold, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. And Jesus answered, said unto them, Have faith in God. And you know the margin of your Bible says, Have the faith. Do faith God's way. Do faith God. How does God do faith? How does God say things? How does he do things? He speaks the end from the beginning, the scripture says. He declares the end from the beginning. What he says at the beginning is the way it's going to end. The way I'm speaking is the way my marriage is going to end. Which is eternally. The way I'm speaking is the way my health is going to end. That's going to be the end result. Have the faith of God. Do things like God would do them. For verily I say unto you, and this is how God works, that whosoever, that's your qualifier right there, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, there is no mixed signal here on what that tumor has got to do. There is no mixed signal here in what that financial mountain has got to do. There's no mixed signal as to what that mountain with your children has got to do. He makes it very plain. Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he not just what he prays, what he says. Let's see, people want to pray one way and then they want to say another way. Dad taught this classic sermon. We'll never forget, I'll never forget the title of it. Who can tell me? Don't separate. Yeah, don't separate your praying from your saying. You, you, you can't separate them. You should, be, you should be speaking the same when you're in prayer or when you're talking to your boss. Don't separate your praying from your saying. We've got to go back through this. Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea. That's a strong signal to that mountain. That mountain does not have to wonder what it's supposed to do. And shall not doubt in his heart. If there's doubt in your heart, you'll hear doubt from your mouth. Am I in faith? If there's doubt in your heart, there'll be doubt in your mouth. From the abundance of the heart, 
the mouth speaks, the scripture says. So you're not supposed to doubt in heart. That doesn't mean doubts don't come. Anybody give an amen to that? Because when you decide you're going to believe for something, doubts try to come. Doctor's reports come. The bills come. The husband acts this way. The wife acts this way. The kids act that way. Doubts try to come. But it's, what, it's how you answer that doubt. When you go back to the word and you say, no, I told the mountain. This is what I said to the mountain. And you go back to the word and you speak the word, then you've handled that doubt with faith. You've answered with faith. Here's the important part. Shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. Can we believe what we've said? Across the board, what we've said when we're on the phone, when we're texting, when we're on social media, can we believe what we've said? If we can't, and this is something we're all reining in, because we're not out on a farm with a plow and a donkey for 12 hours a day and then seeing somebody for a couple hours at night. We are socially, w words are being transferred, Kim, all the time. Over computers, over cell phones, over, over on people. I mean, we're in communication with all the world. So many words are being transferred and the scripture says where there's a, a multitude of words, there's sin. And sin, don't label sin. Sin's missing the mark of being like Jesus. So since we have all these opportunities for words, we have great opportunities to mess up with our words. You know, it's okay not to talk all the time. And when you're going through a battle in your mind and you're, you're overcoming fear and doubt on a subject, it's okay not to talk about it. It's okay to keep your mouth closed. It's okay if somebody asks you about it for you to say, this is what I believe. Because people care. They really care. And then sometimes people just want to know. Whether they care or not, they just want to know. So when it comes to that circumstance, it's perfectly fine for you to say, I'm not going to talk about it. This is what I believe. What makes us think we owe anybody other than the circumstance an answer? Whatsoever he, sh he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. I will have whatsoever I say. I'll have whatever I say. Therefore I say to you, what things soever you desire when you pray. There we go back to pray what you want. Say what you want, whatsoever things you desire when you pray. Not whatsoever things you fear when you pray. We're not supposed to, to go and pray and say, Oh God, you know how many bills I've got. Oh Father, you know how bad the circumstance is. That's not praying what you desire, that's praying what you fear. We're supposed to be praying what we desire. Whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. This passage is life-altering. We could spend a week on this passage, no joke. It's life-altering. We're not saying about the mountain, folks. We're talking to it. We're not supposed to be talking about the mountain. We're supposed to be talking to it. We're not supposed to be talking about the circumstance. We're supposed to be talking to it. And there should be no confusion and no mixed words. It should be very plain what we want to happen in that circumstance. Be removed. Be cast into the sea. You can't misunderstand that. Again, in Luke 17, 6, Jesus is speaking and he said, if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you would say unto this sycamine tree, be plucked up by the root. Now, what part of that tree can't understand that? Be plucked up by the root and be planted in the sea and it should obey you. 
Oh man, that's that's powerful. And you know, if you've heard Dad at all, you've heard him teach this for years. The size of the seed is not what's relevant here. It's the purity of the seed that matters. If you had faith as a seed, you would say, what does a seed do? It produces a harvest. What harvest do you want? My gardeners over here, the most beautiful produce comes from their fields. If you want cabbage, and y'all have got some beautiful cabbage, if you want cabbage, and that's your desire, what do you sow? Well, go figure. <laughs> they sow cabbage when they want cabbage. They sow corn when they want corn. They sow tomatoes when they want tomatoes. They sow squash when they sow squash. And yet in marriage, we sow strife and we expect love to harvest. These words are our seeds. What are we sowing? We're going to sow what we want, not what we fear. If you had faith, you would say, be plucked up by the root. He's even explicit about how it's supposed to happen. Be plucked up by the root and be cast into the sea, and it will obey you. But if you say it's gone, and then the next minute you say, I thought it was gone, I was healed, and then the next day you say, oh, the pain's back, I thought I was healed, we're mixing seed. I'm healed, and then the next day I'm hurting today, I'm mixing seed. Is hurting today what I want? No. Then hurting today is not what I'm going to sow. I'm healed. God's word says this, the doctor says this. I mean, it's just so many ways we can mix and mingle seed. That poor root has no, no idea what to do when we mingle our words. So nothing changes. It continues to grow. That's the power of mingled words. Nothing changes. In fact, we're disappointed. It's really what comes out of it. The relationship doesn't change when there's mixed signals. The body doesn't change when there's mixed signals. The circumstances don't change when there's mixed signals. Mixed signals are weak signals. And weak signals don't produce anything. We got a radio tower right out here on our land. And when that signal gets weak, if something goes wrong in that tower, we have to call Brother Jim. And people will say, hey, I've got the radio on 91.1, but I'm not getting anything. Our lovely engineer, travels out there and he finds out why that signal is weak. Why is that signal weak? Why is it, why is it cut off when there's a weak signal? We got to go to the source, which is ourselves, our tongue, and find out why that signal is so weak and why it's not plain and why the words are not producing what they need to produce. Mixed signals are weak signals and they won't produce. God knew this. Have y'all figured out yet? God is brilliant. I mean, you, you look at something and just remember any New Testament truth has an Old Testament story that you can look at. Leviticus 19, I'm just pulling this out. You can read later. And, and it might look unimportant to us until, we learn, until we're studying this lesson. But I'll never forget Dad's message on this. Don't mingle your seed. This is where he got it from. Leviticus 19.19. 19. God said, you'll keep my statutes. That's his words. You shall not let your cattle gender with a diverse kind. You shall not sow your field with mingled seed. Neither shall a garment mingled of linen and woolen come upon you. Goodness gracious, why did God care if they mix wool with their linen? Why did he care if they sowed different seeds in the same field? Why did he care about the cattle? Well, let's look at some science on hybrids. I put it in your notes. This is from the University of Illinois Extension. I love the wording here. They said not every plant's seeds are worth keeping. We could just do a whole sermon right there. Not every one of our words are worth keeping. They're not all worth keeping. 
Hybrid plants are developed by crossing specific parent plants. Hybrids are wonderful plants, but the seed is often sterile and does not produce true to the parent plant. If my words are God's words and I keep them pure, they will reproduce true to the parent plant. Zoe, God kind of life, comes from his words. Then they say that part's not in the Illinois University words, okay? In case they come after me. Therefore, never save the seed from hybrids. Don't, don't save mixed seed. You know, I wasn't very old when, when I was taught the lesson that mules don't reproduce. And Paul would have some mules. He liked to work the garden even after the equipment came out where he didn't have to. He still liked to use donkeys and mules. This is the way he liked to do it, and we enjoyed watching it. Number seven. I can't tell you how many number sevens he had, but Chip and I made them lots of mud pies with apples in them from Granny's apple tree, cut up with her good paring knife, which we to this day, I don't think know where it, knows where it is. And we tried to feed those donkeys and mules mud apple pies, which they didn't enjoy very much. But Dad taught me at a very young age, mules are great but they won't reproduce. A mule doesn't have mule. It's not, that's not the way it works. You can't, and that's one of the things God told them. He said, don't let your animals uh, breed with other animals. Why? He wanted them to increase. And hybrids don't increase. You stay where you are. Well, he doesn't want us to mingle our seeds. Why? Because we won't increase. If we mingle our seed, we have a hybrid and will remain as we are. He knew what he was doing. Don't mingle your seed. Don't mix your words. Mean what you say and want what you say. Proverbs 18.20, you're all familiar with, I'm sure, from the Amplified. A man's self shall be filled with the fruit of his mouth. Well, let's just think on that one. You will be filled with the fruit of your mouth. What kind of picture does that give us? The good news is if that gives you a really horrible moment, we can change it. We can change what we're sowing. We should smile when we say that. When we're working on this, we're working on our words, we should smile when we say, I am filled with the fruit of my mouth. And with the consequence of his words, he must be satisfied. What, what, is that, what does that do for you? Your words have consequence. Then comes this all-powerful statement. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they who indulge in it shall eat the fruit of it for life, for death, or life. That phrase never gets old to me. It, it, it pops me every time I read it. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they who indulge in it will eat the fruit of it. Our words have fruit. So we've got to look at what we want for fruit, and that's the seed that we sow. Jesus was so wise that he knew when to speak death to something, and he knew when to speak life to something. He spoke death to the fig tree, but he spoke life to humans. He said, the words I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. No mixed signals, because that's confusion. No weak signals, because they're non-productive. Strong signals. That's words on assignment. We've got to learn to use our words put them on assignment. They have a job to do. You know, Proverbs is full of wisdom. It is known as the book of wisdom. And you can't go down through there tonight and write down all the verses that have to do with your words and your lips and your mouth. I, I just put you a few down. I'll just read through them real quick. But you, you're going to have a hard time in, a, in an hour sitting going through and writing down everything the book of Proverbs has to say about your mouth. Now, if that's the book of wisdom, 
I think it'd be very wise for us to pay attention to our words. Proverbs 16, 23, out of the Amplified, says, The mind of the wise instructs his mouth and adds learning and persuasiveness to his lips. Pleasant words are as a honeycomb. They are sweet to the mind, and they are healing to the body. Don't you surround yourself with negative bitterness. It'll kill you. It'll be poison to you. But pleasant words are as honeycomb. They're sweet to the mind and healing to the body. Proverbs 10, 11, The mouth of a righteous man is a well of life. Proverbs 13, 3, He that keepeth his mouth keepeth his life, but he that openeth wide his lips shall have destruction. Proverbs 10, 20, God's word version. The tongue of a righteous person is pure silver. You know what that means? The dross has been removed. The junk has been removed, and a, the tongue of the righteous man is pure. It's not mingled. It's not mixed. It is strong. It is pure. I want to end with a question, and it's a good question. Do my circumstances understand what I'm saying? Does my body, am I sending a strong signal to where my body understands exactly what I'm saying. Does this circumstance, and boy, this was a good lesson for me because I've wavered in some stuff. You know, waiting, letting other people handle, kind of playing with things, you know, just kind of praying that everything in the end works out all right. Do my circumstances understand what I'm saying? If my words are confused, my circumstances are confused. I want to send a strong signal to my circumstances where they know exactly what they are to do. And if I do not doubt in my heart, then I have what I say. Amen. This has been Living Faith from the Russellville Christian Center. If you would like more teaching, you can visit our website at www.rccenter.org or download our app to your device. The Russellville Christian Center is located at 305 Lakefront Drive. If you would like to purchase a copy of this program or if you would like more information, please call 479-968-7965.